Hey, this is Pastor Spencer with Racine Bible Church. You're listening to a sermon from a Sunday morning. This surely is our prayer that we will complete the race faithfully and that when we get to the end, <clears throat> having completed the race, we'll know and we'll celebrate that it, it wasn't I, unaided, but it was Christ in me. If you'd open with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> we'll be in verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, gives six verses telling wives how and why they ought to be a good wife. And then he gives just one little verse to men telling them how and why they ought to be good husbands. It has troubled the church through the ages. Why does the apostle take six verses for the girls and only one verse for the boys? I'm here to answer that question. The smart money is not on the proposition that women are a bigger problem, therefore they require a bigger solution. Smart money's not on that bet. Smart money is on the bet that the apostle knew that men need their instructions to be about as blunt as a two by four and short and sweet. No, actually, interpretively, it's because if you see this whole set here, his theme is responding in a godly way to suffering. And so he always takes more verses for the uh, party in the relationship who is more likely to suffer than he does the party who's in authority. That's actually why, as you track this through of everything that he says. But we're going to get into it this morning with 1 Peter 3, 7. And the title is, A Word to Husbands. We're going to read verse 7. And then Bible uh, interpretation explains, you know, what the words in the verse mean. Bible application pictures and even motivates you to put those things into practice in your life. But one of the things, and I hope you see this in your ABF teaching and in your own personal Bible study, we are, we are always trying to figure out what the Bible means, but you can't figure out what the Bible means until you notice how it means it. In other words, a study of the literary features that are in the text What's the command? What's the reasons behind the command? What are the adjectives that are attached to the verbs? And how does it all put together? So I want to spend just the first two or three minutes showing you how this verse means what it means. And I want to show you the structure of this verse. One command with three reasons for the command. And then after we do that quickly, we'll walk through this command in a way to interpret and apply it to those men in the congregation who are husbands and all of those men in the congregation who are friends with men who are husbands and so that all the women in the congregation who are not yet married can see what this is. Those women in the congregation who are called to singleness can still love those women who are married, those men who are married in Christian brotherhood and sisterhood, there's something here for all of us. So just before we read 1 Peter 3, verse 7, let's ask God to open our hearts. Lord God, we've already sung that it's not us, not I, but Christ, Christ's very living spirit in me. This is our prayer. By the spirit of Christ, prepare our hearts now to learn your word. More than that, Prepare our hearts not only to understand your word, but to love your word. Let your word be to us a law of love. May we be utterly ruled by it. Let your word be to us a physician of love. May we be completely healed by it. Lord of love, give to us the great gift of open hearts to understand and receive and love your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, don't let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, 
but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. We covered those verses in the last two weeks together, the last two Sunday mornings together. This morning, our focus will be on verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. The first word is likewise in verse 7, which is the exact same word as was given to the wives in verse 1, likewise, wives. And the likewise to the men in verse 7 and the likewise to the women in verse 1, they all link back to Christ in verse 21 of chapter 2. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. The same way that Christ walked, that's the way that wives are called to walk in godly submission. The same way that Christ walked, likewise, that's the way that husbands are to walk in selfless honor and love. The same Christian spirit that makes the wife meek and gentle is the Christian spirit that makes the husband kind and considerate who uses his strength to honor his wife, never to harm her. And if you look at verse 7 and what it says and how it says it, there's a command. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman. Live with them and live with them with understanding and honor. That's the command. Live with them with understanding and honor. And then we have three reasons for the command. Reason number one is because of the nature of the wife, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. The created nature of the wife is the first reason for the command. Second reason for the command, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. The second reason for the command is the nature of grace and salvation. That's the second reason. And then the third reason, so that your prayers may not be hindered. The third reason is your relationship with God. So there are at least three reasons why this command to the husbands is good and necessary. First, because of how God created the wife. The weakness of the wife is no reason for husbands to no longer live with their wives or for husbands to show contempt and dishonor to their wives. But to the contrary, the weakness of the wife is the reason for the husband to show honor and respect for the wife. That's how the text frames it. The second reason for the command is because of what salvation is that the wife together with the husband is equally an heir of the grace of salvation. The second reason for the command recognizes a glorious reality that an ungodly chauvinistic society would deny, which is that before God, men and women equally bear the image of God and equally receive the gift of grace in the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then the third reason for the command, and this one's kind of interesting, isn't it? So that your prayers may not be hindered. The third reason this command is so important is God flat out says here, husbands, I take the way you treat your wives so seriously that if you ignore what I say about how you should treat your wife, I want to put you on notice, I will ignore your prayers. What a thing for God to say. But that's the third reason why it's good for every husband to follow this command. Now that we've seen the command and the three reasons for it, I want to walk all the husbands and all the wives and all the single men and women here through understanding this. And you'll see how important it is in your relationship with God and your relationship with the people in the family of God in the church. So I've, I've phrased these points as a, a husband speaking a resolution or something that he's, by the grace of God and open eyes and an open heart, figured out from the word of God and he's taking into his life. So this is a husband talking. And the first thing he says from this text is this. Number one, I need to live with my wife with understanding. I need to live with my wife with understanding. It says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives. Don't pass the obvious just because it's obvious. 
living together is what is called for. For a man and a woman to live together, unmarried, is what the Bible would call living in fornication, living in sin, to use the old-fashioned word. For a husband and wife to live together is precisely what the Bible calls for with that covenant of marriage, giving them God's sanction on their cohabitation. And what this says is the husband should live with his wife throughout her life. They should live under the same roof. They should sleep in the same bedroom. Physicality is included, but it's certainly more than merely physical. Living with, meaning a husband should laugh with his wife, eat with his wife, enjoy a drink in the evening with his wife, enjoy a movie with his wife, verbal communication, listening, understanding, caring, and sympathy. It's all included here. I need to live with my wife with understanding. This commandment forbids unnecessary separation for married couples. Now, of course, there may be work deployments or maybe she will go visit her mother and for various reasons, he won't tag along on that visit. These things are allowable and understandable. But these temporary separations are temporary and they are the exceptions that prove the norm, which is it's God's design that you live together. And how is it that we live together? You see the text? Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. I I don't know, I forget if it's the New American Standard or the King James Version that says live according to knowledge. That's a good translation also. ESV translates it understanding. A, A good translation, maybe in a better translation, is according to knowledge. Because this is the Greek word gnosis, G N O S I S, gnosis. And this is the Greek word that's used in the translation of the Old Testament for sexual intimacy. Adam knew his wife. It means a personal knowledge. It means loving and considerate and intimate knowledge. And so the referent of the knowledge is left unfulfilled in the text. It simply says, husbands, live with your wife according to knowledge. And then he, there are basically two good options for how to fill in what that knowledge is. He could mean... Live with your wives according to knowledge of what God has said about what marriage ought to be. Or maybe he meant live with your wives according to knowledge of who your wife is and what her needs are. Those are like the the two interpretive decisions here. That's the, the two candidates for what the knowledge should be. It could be knowledge of biblical wisdom about the marriage relationship how husbands should dwell with their wives and what, the, what Ephesians and Colossians and Proverbs and Psalms say about the nature of marriage. God's will for husbands. I think a more likely interpretation is he means knowledge of your wife, understanding of your wife's needs and perspectives, understanding of your wife's weaknesses and how your strength should make up for those, understanding of your wife's concerns and needs. I think it means live with your wife according to your knowledge of your wife and work hard at knowing your wife. So here it is, men, a husband who takes the time to gain knowledge of his wife is a good husband, a husband who doesn't take time and concern to to glean and gain knowledge of his wife is a lazy man and not a good husband. And further, A husband who takes the time to gain knowledge of his wife and then uses that knowledge of his wife to show her love and honor and respect is a good and godly husband indeed. That's what I want you to shoot for. That's what I want you to shoot for. And you can't because in your flesh you are lazy and no good, men. So am I. But you can because not I, but what? Christ in me. I'm no longer lazy, no good, fleshly me. Christ died. Christ rose. Christ ascended to send his spirit to liberate me from lazy, self-centered, no good me. And now I can do these things because of Christ in me. And that's what I'm calling you to and nothing less. And that's what I am calling each one of you men who are married to. No exceptions. So how do I gain that knowledge of my wife? How do I gain knowledge of my wife? We know that men, uh, sometimes the signals get crossed 
if we just tell them to do something and we give them a few subtle sort of hints about it, men are like, no, point one, point two, point three, point four. This is how I gain knowledge of my wife. How do I gain knowledge of my wife? Well, how about starting with this? Think about her. What did you first love about her? Study her. What little habits does she have that don't annoy you, but what little habits does she have that endure, endear her to you? Study her. What is she afraid of? And how can you help her with that? What makes her happy? How can you deliver on that? Ask her questions. How do I gain a knowledge of my wife? How about this? Ask her questions and care enough to listen for a long time to the answers. Communicate to your wife that you want her to communicate with you. Communicate to your wife that you want her to communicate with you. You all know, don't you, that we can very strongly, even though non-verbally, you all know, don't you, that we can very strongly, even non-verbally, communicate to someone that we don't want to communicate with them right now. Don't do that. Or stop doing that. And instead, communicate that you want to communicate and encourage them to open up. Do you regularly ask your wife, is there any burden that you're carrying that I can help you with? If you don't, you've failed to implement this passage, and that's one way that you can very quickly begin to implement this good, life-giving, nurturing word. Do you regularly ask your wife, is there any burden you're carrying that I can take off your shoulders? Do you regularly ask your wife, how are you feeling? And then stop and listen and care. Do you regularly communicate to your wife that you love her, that you appreciate her, that she is the only woman for you? Live with your wives according to knowledge. And men, keep in mind, this may shock you, the knowledge that you have of your wife from 11 years ago is no longer pertinent. Women change a lot. Everything changes. From energy levels, to body, to fears, concerns, to friend groups, to pressures, everything changes all the time. So make your knowledge of your wife current. It is uh, telling in a way that nauseates me, frankly. It is telling that your knowledge about the roster of the Milwaukee Brewers is up to date and your knowledge of your wife is vastly out of date. Be a Christ-like husband and turn that around and apply yourself to keeping your knowledge of your wife up to date. Wanting to know about your wife requires what? Love, compassion, concern, Love and compassion and concern are so far from being unmasculine or unmanly. They are the most Christ-like traits, and Jesus Christ was the only true man who has ever lived. Put yourself in her shoes, so to speak. See things from her point of view. Love her enough to imagine what life is like from her perspective. Last night, I was reading a short story. Uh, Two of my favorite female authors are uh, um, Flannery O'Connor and Eudora Welty, both uh, highly regarded Southern novelists that write from the Christ-haunted South, one of my favorite kinds of stories. But anyway, I was reading this short story by Eudora Welty, and uh, it just, it showed me how to see things from somebody else's point of view. This story's about a, a deaf boy. I've never been deaf. This story is about a deaf boy who's never heard anybody talk. And he's about nine, 10 years old. And strangely, where he lives in the South, they have a freeze for the first time in his life. Everything is frozen. And what happens to this deaf boy is he goes outside on this morning that everything is frozen. And for the first time in his life, he sees 
people talking. Everybody who talks outside, it's like he, he sees this vapor that represents their words. And he sees physical evidence, as it were, of their words with his eyes. And he wonders at that all day. And I just, I went to bed last night just thinking about that, what it would be like to be that boy and have that little experience. And I don't know about you, but I think that's the greatest gift of the greatest storytellers, whether they are novelists like Eudora Welty or whether they're songwriters for that matter, is that they, 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 they cause us even instantaneously to inhabit another point of view. And, and one of the things that Peter's calling us to is to have this sort of selfless agape love for our wives, men, where we really consider their point of view. A godly man is marked by that kind of compassion and attentiveness. If that's the first layer of, uh, of application for the men that I need to live with my wife according to knowledge and in an understanding way, what's the second one? And it's this, I need to honor my wife as the weaker vessel. I need to honor my wife as the weaker vessel because it says, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. I believe the best way to interpret what Peter means by that is a physical strength primarily. There are other implications, but the reason this is, I think, the best interpretation is because he uses the word vessel, and this both in the Greek and in the Hebrew represents the, the, that we're made from the clay of the earth. It represents, our, you know, our bodily vessel. And husbands then, if you take this primarily to mean physically, though there are other implications, this, this right off the bat, men, hear this, means that a man must never use his physical strength to harm or abuse his wife in any way. But every man by the living God is called and accountable to only ever use his physical strength to understand and honor and protect and cherish his wife. What do you mean men are stronger than women? Well, men are physically stronger than women. And I'm using the plural. I'm not going to point at anybody, but there may be a woman in this room right now who is stronger than a man in this room right now. Probably is. But, but we're talking creational averages, so to speak. There have always been studies about this. It's ironic, isn't it, that in recent years, the, the studies have actually been twisted and perverted and abused to sort of... Uh, promote men masquerading as women and participating in sports. They kind of tamp down the studies, but the studies, uh, you know, I, th the ones that to me seem credible uh, show that reliably the average male has about 90% more upper body strength and about 65% more lower body strength than the average female. And Peter's saying that the men use that strength and men, you need to use your strength. We have too many passive, uninvolved men in their households. You need to use your strength, your physical strength, your uh, attentiveness strength, your mental strength. You need to use all of your strength for the betterment of your families. If the primary interpretation is physical, there are also many other implications. In the context, I think it's fair to interpret this also as the woman's the weaker vessel in the sense that she's the submissive one in the relationship. And the husband is called to be the head. So she's weaker in terms of authority in this relationship. By marrying, the, by marrying a husband in, in a Christian wedding ceremony, when I do a Christian wedding ceremony or when Darren does or when Wayne does, we, we include in the vows that the wife is vowing to follow her husband's leadership and submit to his headship because that's what Christ calls her to do. And so such a position puts her as the weaker of the two in the sense that he's the head and, and so the head, being the leader, is here charged with a special uh, um, using his strength not to buttress his own position, but to use his strength in consideration of her. Therefore, I would say that this text is uniquely beautiful, and this text is in no way problematic. And it just annoys me to no end when Christians try to tap dance around a text like this, which is just true on a creational, physical, scientific level, 
but the way that it's presented is true in a Christ-like way that shows the beauty of God's design for marriage. So he says, use your strength to what? Show honor to her. What does that mean? It means that your wife belongs to God as his precious daughter before she ever belongs to you. And so you honor your wife as God's precious daughter. You honor your wife as your first human priority. I've gotten in a a couple of uh, arguments with people about this over the years as if as if I'm saying that I don't love my kids with my whole heart, I do love my kids with my whole heart. But God never called us to have a child-centered home. God called us to have a Christ-centered home and then a marriage-centered home and then to care for our children out of the health of our Christian relationship with him and out of the health of our marriage. You honor your wife that way. I adore this little comment from the Scottish commentator, uh, uh, Archbishop Leighton. He says this. um, What does it mean to honor the wife? He says this. Not disclosing the weaknesses of the wife to others or even observing them closely himself. But he hides his wife's weaknesses both from others' eyes and from his own eyes by his great love and esteem for her. What would it be like to be a woman loved that way? How do you honor your wife? Here's a test because we know men sometimes struggle if we make things subtle and sort of ignorable, so here's a test. I'm not going to ask your wife, but I'm going to threaten that I might give her this test. Could your wife say, My husband always talks to me before making major decisions. My husband cares about my opinions. My husband cares about my concerns. My husband asks me questions, and he listens with love to my answers. If you cannot ask someone questions and listen with love to their answers, then you are not honoring or loving that person. You're either using them or demeaning them. Husbands, here are some ideas of what to do and what not to do to help you implement practically honoring your wife. Uh, How about this? Say thank you a lot and express appreciation a lot. I I don't claim to know this perfectly, but in my pastoral experience, most Christian wives are vastly, vastly under encouraged. And most Christian husbands are vastly, vastly uh, under-encouraging to their wives and kids. Say thank you a lot. Express appreciation a lot. Never belittle or insult your wife when you speak to her. Two parts here. One, never belittle or insult your wife when you speak to her. Second, never belittle or insult your wife when you speak about her to others. That's the opposite of honoring her. Never do that. Never compare your wife to other women. Men, stay a thousand, ten thousand men, stay a million miles away from pornography and do whatever it takes to distance yourself a million miles from pornography. Get accountability, get help. Get a dumb cell phone. Do whatever it takes. How do you honor your wife? Help her with what she's doing. There is nothing unmasculine about doing the dishes or vacuuming or folding the laundry. If that communicates honor and love to your wife, that is the most godly thing that a man could do at that point. And do it with a smile. Communicate honor to your wife by sacrificing for her and never complaining about it. Men who don't complain, by and large, are honorable men. Men who complain about everything, by and large, are dishonorable men. Men who whine about the sacrifices they make are boys pretending to be men. Men who sacrifice and do so with such a straight back and such a smile that the people around them barely can even acknowledge that the man is sacrificing, that's a true man. 
Husbands, honor your wives. I need to live with my wife with honor as the weaker vessel. Third resolution I'd like a husband to bring out of this text. I need to share the grace of salvation with my wife. I need to share the grace of salvation with my wife. You see this in verse seven? Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. They are joint heirs with you of the grace of life. Grace of life means the grace of salvation. It means the grace of eternal life. It means the grace of having passed from death to life through the cross of Jesus Christ. So the husband leads in the marriage relationship and the husband is equal and only a joint heir, not an above heir, a joint heir equally with his wife of salvation. So here we have symmetry and asymmetry. We have symmetry. They are equally heirs of salvation. And we have asymmetry. She follows, he leads. We have equality and we have difference. And this is God's beautiful design. If you'd let me quote from this old Scottish commentator one more time, this is how he explains heirs together. If they are heirs together of grace, oh, how loath they will be to despise one another because each of them has been bought by the precious blood of the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And being brought into peace with God, they will do all that they can to continue to have true peace betwixt themselves. This is what it means. This is what it means. How do I share the grace of salvation with my wife? How to carry this out? Two quick ideas for you, husbands. One, make church a priority for yourself and your wife and whatever kids are in the home. Make church a priority. And by church, I mean both corporate worship and ABF. Corporate worship where we sing, we get a missions update, we have the preaching of the word, we celebrate communion, and ABF where we, where, where we encourage one another and we sort of break down how to pray for each other and how to apply these things together. So make church a priority for yourself and your wife. And then second idea, share the word of God with your wife. Now, you can't share the word of God with your wife in a way that's not hypocritical if you're not actually in the word of God for yourself first. And some of you men, I don't want to say many, but some of you men, you, you can't share the word with your wife because you know if you did, you'd be a phony because you're never in the word. Well, get into the word yourself and then share something from that with your wife. It's not that difficult. Make it a priority to read a psalm and a chapter from the New Testament every morning. One psalm and one chapter from the New Testament. And then you got two options. Find one verse from that psalm or from that place in the New Testament that you're praying for yourself and for your wife and then share that with her. Share that with her. With all these practical challenges, especially because we're in this phrase, the grace of life, let me speak a gospel word here. Men, there are many moral changes that you need to make. You need to stop mistreating your wives. You need to speak with love and grace to your wives. You need to quit being angry and cussing all the time. Lots of changes you need to make in your life. But never forget what uh, Charles Spurgeon, the, the wonderful preacher who's taught me so much in my life, this is what he says in his lectures on preaching. He says, to use the pulpit to merely give lessons in moral change to Christian men is like standing in front of a tiger's cage and giving him lessons on being a vegetarian. What a line. What a line. See? See? A deeper change is required. A change of nature. How do I do that? Dr. Phil ain't no help. How do I do that? I don't. But this is why Christ bled and died. This is why his cold body was in the grave. This is why his vivified body walked out of the grave and then ascended to heaven to send his spirit so that not I, but Christ in me could do these things. This is the reality of our gospel. I'm going to leave the last phrase for next week so that your prayers may not be hindered. Leave that for next week just to say that, you know, God is certainly saying there that if you claim to have a relationship with God where he hears your prayers, 
and your, according to God, most important human relationship you're not caring for and you're not loving, then God himself, you know, as it were, oriented to your prayer life, declines his relationship with you. Stunning language. But see, your claim to have a relationship with God isn't based on the fact that you treat your wife perfectly all the time. Back to the gospel. Your claim to have a relationship with God is based on the fact that he has given you grace through Jesus Christ. So men, if, 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 if every one of these practical points is something you're not doing yet and you need to resolve to do, what I'm telling you is bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. If you ask him for help, this is where he wants to help you. Jesus is with you to help you. He'll answer your prayers to help you do these things. This is why he lived and died and rose again. There's no sense in which you can do these things unaided with your old carnivore tiger nature. You can do these things with the new nature that Jesus Christ, by his grace, places inside of you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, hear our prayer. We confess our sin. We men confess our sin that we've used the strength you've given to us for selfish and even sinful purposes. We confess this. We loathe it and we turn from it. And we ask that by the Spirit of Christ, you would enable us with joy to use our strength to love God and lovingly honor the wives that God has given to us. Pray, Lord, that this good word from you would resonate in the hearts of all those who hear it so that they might be strengthened, and so that this church might manifest the love of God in Jesus Christ in the way that we love one another in our marriages. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. To find out more about our ministry, contact us at racinebible.org. Thank you for listening.